When God does his work in the world, uh, he uses people, uh, which is a, seems like a really flawed strategy because it involves people. And you know yourselves, and you know people. But God, time and time again, is using people to do his work to accomplish a cosmic plan of salvation. God uses people. And we see that throughout Scripture. It's just again and again. It involves people. The whole story is about a God and his people. And as we flip the pages, uh, time and time again, we see him using people. Abraham and Sarah and Ruth and Deborah and Peter and Mary and Elizabeth. And the list goes on and on as we look at the list of people. And as we're flipping through the pages of Scripture, there's kind of this... Um, assumed question that we ask our, or that we think in the back of our mind. Maybe we don't articulate it this way, but we're always wondering, who's next? Like, who's God going to use next? Okay, that happened. Who, what crazy thing is he going to do with that person? And who's next? And who's next? And the Bible is this story of people that God uses again and again. We think of Isaiah the prophet. God spoke to him and said, who will I send? And who will go for us? It's kind of the question, who's next? And that's just kind of a, a recurring cycle throughout Scripture. Who's next? What's God going to do next? And who is he going to use again and again? On this day, we install Pastor Nathan Schultz. And as he and I were talking about today, he said, I don't want it to be about me. I want it to be about the church. I want it to be about God's people. I want it to be about Jesus. And I want to ask the question, who's Next, That question really came from Pastor Nathan and his heart. Who's next? Pastor Nathan was raised by uh, good people in southeast Michigan. They are with us today. It's kind of like this is your life. We brought people from Nathan's life uh, here today. Um, his mom and dad are here today, Ron and Chris. Ron and Chris, could you just stand for a moment? And everybody, uh, look right back there. That's Ron and Chris. Let's give them a hand for being here today. From the great state of Michigan, made the trek here, and we're grateful for that. Um, Ron is also a pastor, and so you might think, well, of course, it's natural that Nathan would be a pastor, but Nathan told me, uh, not really. His dad didn't want to pressure him. I don't know if he said that you didn't encourage him, but um, you were careful and sensitive, Ron, about pressure or about assuming that just because your dad is a pastor. And so Ron knew, and Chris knew, that God calls God makes the call about who's next. That, that comes from God. We don't manipulate it. We don't make it happen. And so Nathan's story continued. He goes off to college, uh, to Milwaukee, uh, to Concordia University in Mequon, the Milwaukee area. And while at college, he meets a handsome young pastor. <laughs> By the way, hey, we, I, we've been doing this at every service in our church Last night, two services this morning, we made it here, and every time I talk about Pastor Mark Engelhart, I use different adjectives. I ended on, one. nicest one, young and handsome, Mark Engelhart, who was a church planner at the time in the Milwaukee area, planting a church called Reconcile. Nathan got connected with that community, and it was so impactful for him. Uh, Pastor Mark is with us today. Pastor Mark, could you stand for a minute? Just give everybody a, a wave. Everybody, uh, welcome Pastor Mark. He came all the way from the great state of California, Prince of Peace uh, in uh, Fremont, California. He's a pastor there now, and we're honored that he could make the trek to be with us today. But that was such an important moment in Nathan's life, to have a pastor who would spend time with him, pour into him, challenge him, push him. Um, and Nathan, I can only pray that you have done and will do that for others as well. You'll be that kind of pastor. Uh, that others will receive what you speak into them as well. But that was so critical. And Nathan told me, too, that that community, that church plant community was so important to him because they prompted that question, who's next? Who's next? And even more than that, they, they said, we see in you a pastor. We need you to do this for us. You are next. He heard that call in that ministry in Milwaukee. You are next. So Pastor Nathan goes to seminary to be a pastor, and he goes to Concordia Seminary, which happens to be here in uh, St. Louis, Missouri. And Pastor Mark and I go back maybe 15 years or so, and we had been a part of a network that we had connected with, and 
So Pastor Mark directed him uh, our way, and one day Pastor Nathan shows up. We, we were not in this space at this time. We were on the, at the Grandel Theater on Grand. Raise your hand if you were with our church when we were at the Grandel Theater, okay? You know what? That's kind of cool. I'd say a third, maybe. A third, which means a lot of you have come since then. That's the way it's supposed to be. Um, and we're in the Grandel Theater. This uh, young, smiley guy walks in uh, with a big smile and a bigger heart, and that was Pastor Nathan. And little did we know uh, that we would have this journey together. I've been reflecting with Pastor Nathan that, you know, what are the chances that you would be with us and, and do field work? What are the chances that you would meet your wife in our church, too? And we're grateful for Susie, who's with us today. Uh, who makes you a better man, and what are the chances that you would both come back and still be with us, uh, even now in ministry? And that is a gift. Pastor Nathan, uh, while he was at seminary, uh, he worked in coffee shops. He was, you may not know this, Pastor Nathan was a bouncer at a bar. <laughs> Can you picture that? Yeah. I mean, you, you know his nice side. He's got the, the mean side, too, and bouncer at the bar. And so a lot of his friends uh, come from that community, and he loves, he, he made such deep friends, and this is one thing I admire about Pastor Nathan is um, he values his friendships, and he made such deep friendships with those that he worked with, whether at coffee shops or in the bar scene, so that to come back to St. Louis was a gift uh, for him and for Susie because they have long, deep friendships with those folks. Um, and as he comes back, he also cares deeply for them and uh, longs for them to know what he does to know Jesus and to know his heart. And so um, as he was telling me about this, he said, my question is, who's next? Who will go with me? Uh, I, I want people to go with me and meet my friends. I want people, uh, or I want a people to bring my friends too. That's all of you. And what kind of people do we need to be that we can invite our friends into this community and be the people of God? That is such an important question. And it prompts us to ask, who's next? And are we next? And who else do we need next? The gospel is so relational. Uh, this thing we call Christianity is so relational. It always runs along relational lines. It involves people, messy people who are redeemed by the blood of Jesus and then repurposed for holy use. And the question is, who is next? As we flip through Scripture, we see it again and again. Another name, another person. When God works, when He does His plan, He uses people. Flawed people, messy people, but He uses people. And God's people were always in the story, in the next generation, and they were always asking, who's next, and who's next? And God would raise somebody up, the patriarchs, or the judges, or the prophets. God would always raise up somebody, but God's people were still asking, no, who's really next? Like, who's really going to heal us, the deepest wounds in our hearts? Who's really going to deliver us out of a desperate situation? Because these names kept coming and going, and they would do God's work, but there was always left more. Until finally one name that is above every name, a name at which we will all kneel and bow and confess that he is Lord. One name rises above all the rest in this book. We talked about it with the kids, the name that's at the center of the story. Jesus Christ is the next, the ultimate next one. And he's not just next, he's also now, in the moment, we worship him as a present Lord, not a past Lord or not just a future Lord that we're waiting for someday, but one who is with us now, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In Revelation, it says that Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the one who is, the one who was, the one who is to come, the Almighty. He's the ultimate next one. He's the center of the story. One thing I love about Pastor Nathan is that he is so sincere. He's so genuine. You might say a lot of things about him, but you can't say that he's not authentic. He has a hard time lying. He can't lie. He can't fake it. He's just so genuine. That's his heart. 
And so one thing that I love that he says again and again, and maybe he said it to you, is he says, I actually believe this. <laughs> it might sound kind of funny from a pastor, but it's important. I actually believe this. I, I believe this really matters. This Jesus of Nazareth. I believe that his death for us actually has done something. It has changed us, given us a new identity. I actually believe that he rose from the dead. It's the craziest thing that Christians believe. And that he's a living Lord at this moment. Nathan says, I actually believe this, and it actually matters. He has said that to me. Maybe he said it to you. He says it to his friends who don't actually believe that. But he's so genuine, he just wants them to know his heart. Like, hey, you might not believe this, but I actually believe this. It's true. And it changes everything. That's Nathan's heart. That's our heart. We actually, we actually believe this. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. Ministry is hard. To be the church is difficult. It would be easier not to do this. Not to follow this Jesus of Nazareth. That would be the easy way. But we actually believe it. And he has done something in us that we cannot deny. And we are compelled by his love and mercy for us. So we actually believe it. And there are people around us who are desperate for something. Who have tried again and again something different. And it fails them. So they try something different. They try a different relationship. They try a different career. And it never quite fulfills. And they're looking. We have people around us who are addicted. We have people around us who are depressed and isolated and lonely. We have people around us who are stuck in the rat race of life and they can't get out. Who are searching for something. Who are searching for God, but they don't even know it. And so the call still remains. Who will go for us? Who will, who will I send? Who's next? Who's going to go? Today, on February 12th, is that today? February, February 12th, 2023, Pastor Nathan raises his hand and he says, I'll go. I'll do it. In Jesus' name. I'll be next. And Pastor Nathan is asking all of us, well, who's next? Who's coming with me? I'm coming. I'm with you, Pastor Nathan. Who else is next? Who's going to come? Lest we look over our shoulder and there's no one behind us. Who's next? It's the question ringing in our ears today. Who will go? Because the time is urgent. This is real. The days are short. There's work to do. This matters. We long to see more people loved by God in Jesus Christ and more people compelled by that love to be sent. And so we say, I'll do it. I'll go. Onward. In Jesus' name. Amen.